nanohub.org. Okay, so today is the third lecture in the course, and the topic is uh, advanced topics or additional topics in scanning telemicroscopy. So this will be the last lecture devoted to STM. The next lecture will make a transition from scanning telemicroscopy to atomic force microscopy. And then we'll start to talk about uh, atomic forces uh, between a tip and a substrate. Uh, but before we get there, I just wanted to review a few uh, important topics, things that are interesting in the, in the world of scanning telemicroscopes. microscopes. And the, um, the agenda for today is to, um, is to discuss a little bit about the scanning tunneling spectroscopy, uh, this current imaging tunneling spectroscopy, so-called CITS. Right? Both of these techniques are designed to give you local information, local electronic information about substrates. Uh, they're inherently an electrical technique. Uh, we also want to talk about the barrier height, and we want to talk about measurements of that barrier height, how accurate it can be measured. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about forces on a tip. This will start to set up the AFM discussion uh, in another week or so. We'll talk about how high is an atom, right? That's referred to as atomic corrugation. And then the last topic will be a uh, just a brief discussion of this quantum corral that uh, uh, has has gotten a lot of attention in the last last few years. So uh, this is basically a review of how a scanning tunneling microscope works. You recall if there is no bias, if there is no voltage between the tip and the substrate, and if the tip is brought to within an nanometer or so of the substrate, then uh, there's a there's a, a approximately square square potential barrier. The width of that barrier is D. <clears throat> there are electrons on either side of the barrier. Uh, they are prevented from flowing from the tip to the substrate or vice versa by the presence of this work function barrier, this, this parameter we call phi sub barrier in this diagram off to the left. <clears throat> because of because electrons are fermions, they obey Fermi-Dirac statistics, all the electron states in the tip and the substrate are filled up to a characteristic energy, which is referred to as the Fermi level, E sub f. That's shown as a, as a solid red line in this diagram. All the energy states below E sub f are filled. All the energy states above E sub f are empty. That statement is rigorously true at zero degrees Kelvin. When you, uh, when you have a tip and a substrate that are, let's say, at room temperature, there's a small smearing of that Fermi level. And uh, there are some states above the Fermi level that are filled, and there are some states below the Fermi level that are empty. But for, for the purposes of this talk, we're going to pretend like the Fermi level is a sharp demarcation between the filled and the unfilled states. Uh, the question becomes, what happens if you apply a voltage to the tip? Uh, now, when you read the literature, it's important for you to be sensitive to the fact that the voltage could be applied either to the tip or the substrate. And it's up to the author of the paper to tell you where the voltage is applied with respect to. Very often, this is a confusing feature uh, when you're trying to sort out some of these uh, uh, published works. But in this case, we're going to take the substrate is grounded, we're going to apply a negative voltage to the tip, and we, we then have the situation that's shown in the upper right panel of this slide. Uh, the negative voltage applied to the tip causes an electric field to set up between the tip and the substrate. In addition, that, uh, that uh, negative voltage raises the Fermi level of the tip with respect to the substrate. And now all the electrons that are enclosed in that blue uh, blue shaded box, all those electrons can quantum tunnel through the barrier of finite width and, uh, and, and move into the substrate. So there's actually a tunnel current that's set up between the tip and the substrate if you apply a negative voltage to the tip. <coughs> the tunnel current is dominated by electrons. Um, 
at the top of the Fermi energy, near the Fermi energy of the tip. That's indicated by the dark uh, black arrow. As you go down in energy, right, the transmission probability decreases. And so the contribution of the tunnel current to electron states that are, uh, let's say, an uh, EV below the Fermi level of the tip, that contribution is diminished. It just depends on uh, how far down you actually go uh, in energy. And that, that, of course, is adjustable because you can apply any bias voltage you want to the tip, right? The bias voltage can be uh, a millivolt or one volt. That's experimentally under your control. Um, the tunnel current flows, okay, it should be clear, the tunnel current flows because the states on the, on the left of the barrier are filled, they're below the Fermi level. The states that they tunnel into on the right are above the Fermi level, so those states are empty, right? And so electrons, you can't put more than two electrons in a given state, and so if you want to into a given quantum state. So if you want to set up a tunnel current, you want electrons to go from quantum states on the left of the barrier to quantum states on the right of the barrier, you have to make sure that the states on the right of the barrier are empty or otherwise the electrons won't go. Okay, So that, for instance, is why there's, there's no tunnel current uh, below that blue band. Right? In principle, those electrons could tunnel from the tip to the substrate, but if they do so, they'll tunnel into filled states, states that are already filled, and because they're filled, they can't accept uh, any more electrons. And for that reason, the tunnel current ends abruptly uh, in that, at the bottom of that, that blue box. Uh, there's nothing sacred about a negative applied voltage. You can apply a positive applied voltage. If you apply a positive applied voltage, then what you do is you just reverse the polarity of everything I just said. Right Now electrons will tunnel from the substrate to the tip. Uh, again, the electrons uh, at the top of the Fermi level of the substrate, those will tunnel with the highest transmission probability. And as you move down in energy, the the arrows that decrease in intensity indicate schematically that the tunnel current at those energies uh, is, uh, is reduced, okay? So this, this scanning tunneling spectroscopy, this STS, uses this effect of applying a bias voltage between the tip and the substrate, rastering the bias voltage in a systematic way, and just measuring the tunnel current that flows. And in the process of doing that, you actually learn something about the filled and unfilled states of the substrate. Okay, the first situation when you're tunneling into unfilled states, you're mapping out how many electron states there are versus energy that are unfilled. In the bottom case on the, on the bottom right of this slide, when you reverse the polarity of the bias, right, you're actually probing the filled states of the substrate uh, Within, elect within EV of the, of the Fermi level, okay? So it's a very clever way to sort out how many electron states are filled, how many electron states are empty, right? Now, what determines the uh, electron flow in more detail? Um, basically, again, I write down an equation. I'm going to justify it. I won't derive it. <clears throat> the total tunnel current that flows is a constant. It's 4 pi times the electronic charge divided by Planck's constant, h bar, times an integral over all energies, right? From minus, minus infinity to positive infinity. That integral has uh, four terms that are noteworthy, okay? So let's start at the end and work backwards. Uh, the term that's labeled T of uh, epsilon and V, that's the transmission probability then an electron will tunnel through that barrier at a certain energy E, or a certain energy epsilon, for a certain applied voltage V, right? So the first homework set in this course gives you some experience in calculating this transmission probability for a square barrier for different energies, right? And you'll see that that transmission probability varies exponentially, right, with energy. To a, to a very good approximation, right? 
So the transmission probability at the Fermi level uh, could be small. It could be 10 to minus 6, 10 to minus 7. But as you go down in energy, the transmission probability decreases rather rapidly. And so all the tunnel current is basically carried by the electrons uh, indicated by that dark arrow inside the tunnel barrier, that, that energy. Right? The electrons at that energy carry the dominant part um, of, the, of the tunnel current. But nonetheless, if you want to do an exact calculation, you have to integrate over all energies. And that's what this equation says. So you got to know that the, the transmission probability T. <clears throat> there are two density estates uh, terms. Uh, these are local density estates. These tell you how many electrons are available uh, at a particular energy epsilon. There's a density estates of the substrate and the density estates of the tip. And these two density estates are offset one by another simply by the bias voltage that we apply. That's EV, that's the voltage applied to the, uh, uh, in, in other words, it's, it, it, it takes into account the fact that the, the Fermi level of the substrate has been shifted down by applying this minus voltage to the tip. All right, so we have to, in principle, know those things if we want to make an absolute calculation of the tunnel current. In practice, what we want to do is we want to measure the tunnel current and infer something about density of states. So we want to work backwards. And I'll show you how that comes about. The term in the square brackets is the difference in the Fermi function between uh, the electrons on the left and electrons to the right of the barrier. Right? So this Fermi function is a well-known function in, in condensed matter physics. I just make a plot of it here, uh, just so we can discuss it in more detail. It basically varies between 1 and 0, and it tells you the probability of occupation that a certain electron state will, uh, will have as a function of energy with respect to the Fermi energy. Right? So at, at uh, very low temperatures, like 5 degrees Kelvin, right, that Fermi function is a sharp step. It's a very distinct step function. As the temperature increases, the Fermi function spreads out. And you can, you can see I did calculations for 1,000 and 5,000 Kelvin. You can start to see that 5,000 Kelvin, that step function gets broadened into a, a gentle, gentle step that now varies significantly over a few EV in, in energy. At 300 Kelvin, right, that step is about... Uh, 0.025 electron volts wide, okay? So if you just plug in room temperature, which is about 300 Kelvin, into that function in the top and evaluate it, uh, evaluate the Fermi-Dirac function, you'll find that it's, uh, uh, it's not such a sharp step as 5 Kelvin, but it's still pretty sharp, right? And so to a very good approximation, when, when we take data at uh, room temperature, right, we just approximate this Fermi, Fermi Dirac function as a step function, which is one below the Fermi energy and zero above, right? Now, the reason I, I mention that is because, uh, this term in the square brackets in this equation is the difference in the Fermi function between the tip and the substrate, okay? And if you work that out, it's just the difference in two step functions. One step function is shifted with respect to the other. And basically what it says is that in the region where, which is indicated by the blue shadowed box, right, that term in square brackets is unity. And outside that region in energy indicated by that, that square blue box, the Fermi, the difference in the Fermi functions is zero, right? So, what that means is that integral from minus infinity to infinity over all energies can be now uh, approximated by an integral just over the region of energies given by this EV that's shown on the right. So only the electrons between the Fermi energy of the tip and the Fermi energy of the substrate contribute to the tunnel current. And we can simplify that integral quite nicely uh, we don't have to go over all energies anymore, okay? So those are the four features that determine, in principle, the tunnel current in any STM experiment.
okay? It's hard to evaluate uh, rho sub tip. It's hard to evaluate rho sub substrate. Instead, what we do is we make some simple approximations and we try to infer the density of states on the substrate from measurements of the tunnel current. And that's what I'll I like to like to illustrate in the next next slide. Okay. So if we make the measurements at room temperature or below, right, uh, the uh, the smearing of the Fermi Dirac uh, distribution function is only about uh, 0.025 electron volts, which is pretty small. So that means that if we restrict our attention to voltage swings, voltage bias swings between the tip and the substrate, much greater than 0.025 volts, right? We can well approximate the Fermi function as a step. Right, so typically, experiments are done by sweeping the bias voltage between, let's say, minus 500 and 500 millivolts. That's about 20 times kT, so it's a reasonably good approximation. There's a question. Um, is the Fermi energy of the tip and the substrate almost equal, or how, how does it matter? Well, in this discussion, we're pretending that the Fermi energy of the tip and the substrate are the same, okay? That's not always the case. And what happens is when you set up this, this uh, tunnel junction at zero bias, at zero voltage, there will be a certain amount of current that flows one way or the other to initially shift the Fermi levels of the tip and substrate so that they are the same. The way that happens is charge actually will transfer from either the substrate to the tip or the tip to the substrate. And in the process of transferring, the Fermi levels will realign. Okay. The net result is the square barrier that we assume between the tip and the substrate is now no longer square. There's an internal electric field that sets up between the tip and the substrate. And that just causes a complication of the uh, in describing the detailed shape of that barrier. In reality, we don't know what that barrier looks like. I'll tell you honestly up front right now. We approximate it as a square step, but we have no way of, of, of measuring it experimentally. We can measure certain things. We can measure certain quantities, and I'll describe that in a few minutes. And I can show you that the height of the barrier that we get out is reasonable compared to work functions of, of, of well-known metals, right? But in, in all honesty, we don't really have a very detailed uh, equation to describe that, that barrier shape, okay? So the first equation on this slide, right, takes into account the fact that the Fermi Dirac distribution function can be approximated as a sharp step. And the net result is that that integral from minus infinity to infinity now just spans the range of the bias voltage V that we apply between the tip and the substrate. So you can see the, the uh, integral limits have, have changed. In addition, we have made the assumption that the density of states of the tip doesn't change a whole lot with energy. Right, and we pull that out of the integral. So we say density of states of the tip is a constant. We can pull it out of the integral. And we also can approximate uh, this transmission probability, which again is difficult to calculate for a realistic barrier. We can approximate that by some average transmission probability t, and we can pull that out of the integral also. So with some reasonable approximation, the tunnel current that flows now is just an integral of the density of states of the substrate over the range in, in energy that's specified by the bias voltage that we apply. Okay? And it follows from the second equation on this slide that if we could take the derivative of the current with respect to the voltage, right, we basically undo that integral, and we are left with a, 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 an expression that has a bunch of constants that we don't really know, 
times a quantity which is proportional to the density of states of the substrate at the bias voltage that we apply. Right? So to a very good approximation, what we're saying is that the derivative of the current with respect to applied voltage, if we can somehow measure that quantity or evaluate it, right, we, we actually have a quantity now that's proportional to the density of states of the substrate. And that is the, that is the, uh, the end goal of, of STS, scanning tunneling spectroscopy. It's to measure something that's proportional to density of states of the substrate. Right. So how is the experiment actually done? <coughs> well, we, we tried to introduce this idea that if you move the tip across the substrate in a rastered way, in a controlled way, right, all the while maintaining a constant tunnel current, we tried to, we tried to convince you that, that that experiment allows you to infer the topography of the substrate. Right? So you have this very sensitive height monitor because you're scanning the tip and maintaining a constant tunnel current. And in the process of scanning the tip and maintaining a constant tunnel current, you've got to move the tip up and down, and the tip moves up and down in just the right amount to, to uh, mimic the, 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 the geographic, the topographic features on the substrate. Right? So if you measure measure how much the tip moves up and down, and let's say each grid point in the substrate, the grid points are specified by these cross-hatched lines in this diagram, you get a very nice topographical image which allows you to see atoms, okay? But if in addition, at each point that you do a topographic measurement, you now ramp the voltage and measure the tunnel current, Right, you start to do a scanning tunneling spectroscopy experiment at every point in your image. Right, and this this is referred to in the lit literature as a current imaging tunneling spectroscopy, a CITS, and it basically means that you've got a, a one image which is topographical, and then you've got another image which is basically how the current varies as a function of applied voltage at every point on your substrate. Okay, now why would you want to do that? Well, because if you pick out a particular bias voltage, in this case I, I indicate, let's say, six bias voltages indicated by those, those black dots, right? So those are somehow preset bias voltages that I'm very interested in. If I can measure the slope of the current voltage curve at each of those six data points, then according to the discussion on the previous slide, I am measuring something that's proportional to the density of states of the substrate, because di dv is proportional density of states of the substrate to a good approximation, right? And so that is that is the important uh, quantity that we want to get out of this. We want to measure uh, at preset bias voltages. Some these preset bias voltages are something that the user could then specify. We want to measure basically the slope of the IV curve at every bias voltage and then therefore infer what the density of states of the substrate is at each of those those voltages. So on paper this sounds like a great uh, technique. The problem is it's time consuming, right? If you have to sweep out a IV curve at each data point, right, you're going to extend the length of a measurement uh, by factors of two or three beyond which you just acquire the topographic image. So for instance, a typical topographic image has 256 by 256 data points, right? If in addition you want to do an IV curve at each of those 256 by 256 data points, you're going to get a massive amount of data, right? And it's going to take a long time to acquire all that data. So very often you'll take a topographic image, let's say with a resolution of 256 by 256, but maybe you'll only do a 64 by 64 uh, CITS scan to cut down the time it takes. So the the you're limiting the information that you get from the CITS data 
by restricting the number of data points that you perform IV curves as you as you scan the topography. So software packages now have all that built in where you can specify how many CITS data points you want. You don't have to take a data point at every every pixel in the image, right? But even so, even so, if you reduce the number of uh, IV curves by, let's say, a factor of 10 below the number of pixels in your image, you still have tens of minutes to acquire a CITS image. And that means there's a significant drift, right? There will usually be a significant drift between the start of your image and the end of your image, right? And so the, the image, unless your microscope is drift compensated, right? You'll, you'll sort of lose track of where you're at in the process of performing the CITS measurement. So it's for this reason that people use low temperature scanning telling microscopes. They go to 4 Kelvin. Because if you go to 4 Kelvin, right, the thermal drift essentially disappears. You can start a CITS image at 5 o'clock at night. And you can let it run all night and come back the next morning. And the tip is drifted in a in an absolute sense by just a fraction of an angstrom from where it was at the beginning, right? So most of the CITS data, most of it is done at low temperatures be, in order to eliminate the the thermal drift. Okay. Yes. Can I ask a question. I mean, this uh, correlation between DIVB and density of states uh, is, uh, or at least theoretically, it's sort of developed for a constant or where the gap. Is, is a fixed number. So for a fixed gap, you ramp like this is B. Um, uh, I wonder in, in the CITS thing, you know, as you go point to point, you got to keep the gap constant and change the voltage. That seems like a hard thing to do. Uh, and, yeah. you know, and how do you choose what yeah. you have to do with that? And what are the implications? So the, the question. The question basically uh, involves whether this transmission function T can be brought outside the integral, right, and replaced by some average value of T. And the answer is, of course not, it can't. But it's very hard to evaluate the transmission unless someone tells you what the exact shape of the barrier is. We don't know the exact shape, so we're left with these uh, crude approximations. It turns out there are ways that have been developed to minimize the influence of the variation of the transmission probability with voltage, right? And there are, there are techniques that have been, there, that are published in the literature which allow you to try to divide that out, that variation in T out to a first approximation. But in reality, all you're looking for is whether you know, it's hard to make quantitative estimates. You can say the density of states goes up or it goes down with with voltage, but you can say maybe it goes up by a factor of two or it decreases by a factor of two. But you can't you can't get too much more detail than that. Well, you, people do it, but I don't, I don't know how believable it is. Right? <laughs> people do all kinds of things, but yeah, it's that that taking T out of the the integral is a big approximation. How do you actually make the experiment work? Right, You have to think about this because uh, this experiment is not, uh, not the same as taking an image. Right? What you basically have to do in the process of a CITS experiment is you have to turn off your feedback loop. And the reason you have to turn off your feedback loop is because the current is not going to vary as you ramp the voltage, right? In fact, the current's going to change polarity. If you, you change the polarity of the voltage, the current will change polarity, right? Now, the feedback loop is, of course, designed to keep the tip at a fixed distance above the substrate. So if the current starts to vary and the feedback loop is on, feedback loop is going to start to, to do some really crazy things to try to maintain a constant tunnel current. So the first thing you have to do is you have to turn off the feedback loop, and that's what's indicated in the top panel of this, of this slide. 
After the feedback loop has been turned off, you then have to ramp the bias voltage in a smooth way from some initial bias to some final bias. So from minus V to plus V. And <clears throat> while you're ramping the bias voltage, right, you then have to measure the tunnel current. In particular, there's usually a preset number of, of voltage points where you measure the tunnel current. And then from this IV curve, after it's been accumulated, you then have to take a derivative and you have to evaluate the slope of the IV curve at different points uh, indicated by those solid, indicated schematically by those solid dots on this curve. Right? This is all at one pixel. This is all at one XY position of the tip above the substrate. You have to repeat this process as you raster the tip in a systematic way over the sample. Right? You constantly have to be turning the feedback on and off, on and off, ramping the voltage, measuring the tunnel current. So clearly, if there's a big drift, if there's a big drift in the tip when you turn the feedback off, if the tip approaches the substrate or pulls away from the substrate, then your measurement of IV is meaningless. Right? The implication is that when you turn the feedback off, the tip stays in a fixed position above the substrate. This allows you then to ramp the voltage in a controlled way, measure the tunnel current. But if the tip is drifting in or out, after the feedback loop is off, this is tough. This is very hard to uh, uh, deal with. Right? So it's a beautiful measurement, but it, it requires a lot of, uh, a lot of con uh, care to, to ensure that you do it correctly. Uh, what does the typical data look like from a CITS measurement? And I just show this, uh, this sequence of images that I obtained from the Omicron website. Right. What you can see is each image is taken at a different bias voltage. Right. So each image corresponds to one of the black dots on the IV curve that I showed previously. And the important thing for you to recognize is that the images vary as the bias voltage is changed. Right. So that's the take home message. Right. If every image looked exactly the same, then there's, this wouldn't be interesting. But the fact that the uh, images taken at, let's say, plus two volts looks different than the images taken at minus two volts is telling you something about how the local density of states on the silicon surface varies as the bias voltage or as the energy of the electrons is swept over the plus two to minus two volt range, right? So this is a typical output from a CITS image, right? It's a sequence of images, each image taken at a different bias voltage. And then theorists will go in and they'll try to interpret the details of the image by calculating local density of states and trying to compare their calculations to experiment. Okay, so they try to reproduce these images uh, from first principles theory. Okay? Yeah. Silicon 7 by 7 reconstructed surface is metallic. How do one can get the band structure for this? Reworded surface. So silicon 111 surface is metallic. 7 by 7 reconstructed surface. How do two STS studies how can one can derive the band structure? So the band structure, by the band structure, I assume you mean the amount of doping that occurs, no. right? The band gap is 1.2 EV for silicon, right? So, I mean, if, if that's what you mean by band structure, right, then basically the IV curve will be reasonably flat around V equals zero by plus minus 0.6 volts, right? That'll reproduce the band gap in silicon, right? So if, if you see the current is suppressed near V equals zero, of course, when V equals zero, there's no current that flows. But if there's a true band gap in silicon, right, as you bias the tip with respect to the substrate, no current should flow until you hit either the conduction band or the valence band edge. And that's when the tunnel current would pick up and start to, to increase above I equals zero on this, this diagram. So the crude band structure can be inferred by just looking at how flat 
the current is over what bias voltage range, right? And then you can infer from that a, a, a band gap, if, if that's what you mean by band structure, right? I wanted to say something about the uh, the apparent tunnel barrier height, this parameter phi that appears in all this discussion of scanning telling microscopy. That's a very important parameter because <clears throat> if you think about it, that that phi sub barrier quantity determines the attenuation coefficient alpha that determines the exponential dependence of the tunnel current with position z. Right, and so if you want to know how rapidly the tunnel current falls off, is is the distance between the tip and the substrate is varied, you've got to make a measurement of that barrier height phi. So uh, there's a standard way to do that, and since the current varies uh, exponentially with with position z, uh, the logical thing to do would be to take the natural logarithm of both sides of that that expression i equals i naught e to the minus 2 alpha z, right? So if the work function, if the barrier height is measured in joules, and if the position z is measured in meters, right, then that equation is, uh, uh, is consistent. But usually we measure z in angstroms, and we measure work function barriers in electron volts. Right, so if you want to convert that equation from the standard SI set of units into a more convenient set of units, you have to change uh, uh, change the units, and I indicate how you do that by the two numbers in red. Um, and what you can find is that this constant that now multiplies z in this special set of units where z is in angstroms, the work function barriers in electron volt, that constant turns out to be 1.029, right? So you'll see that 1.029 in the literature all the time. It's, they rewrite the top equation, i equals i naught e to the minus 1.029 times z, where z is, uh, or times the square root of the barrier in electron volts times z in angstroms. Okay, now why do we do this? Well, we do this because it follows that if you take the derivative of the natural log of the current with respect to z, right, if you just take the derivative of the, uh, the fifth line on that slide you know, and you square it, right, you square it, you'll find out that that derivative is equal to this constant 1.029 times the barrier height in electron volts. And so if you're in the business of trying to measure the exact value of that barrier height, the way to do it is to measure how the current varies with z. Take the slope of that, the derivative of the natural log of i with respect to z, square it, right? Divide by this 1.029, and you'll end up with an expression on the bottom which tells you what the barrier height in electron volts is. So this was a big issue in the early days of STM. Right? Everyone realized that this simple square barrier was an approximation, but the issue was how crude of an approximation was it. And so lots of people tried to measure barrier heights. Right? So what you should know is that most barriers for metals, for refractory metals, most barriers are on the order of four and a half to five and a half electron volts. So you would expect that barrier heights coming out of this, this measurement would be somewhere on the order of 4 to 5 EV. In practice, the numbers that we were all getting at the time was uh, closer to 1 EV, right? about a factor of 4 or 5 lower than what we expected. And the question was, you know, is this, is this square barrier approximation that bad that it causes you to miss the, the height of the barrier by a factor of 4 or 5? Right, so that was a big, big puzzle. Right, uh, person that first explained to me the the nature of the problem was uh, Fleming Biesenbacher. Uh, 
he published a very nice paper in 1996, and I referred to that paper here. What he did is he very carefully measured the uh, variation in the tunnel current as you change the position between the tip and the substrate. He made the measurements in ultra-high vacuum. He took extreme care to clean the tip. He took extreme care to clean the substrate, right? And when he did these, uh, uh, when he when he took all kinds of uh, precautions in ma making sure that his tip was clean and the substrate was clean, he actually found a, uh, a tunnel current that did in fact vary exponentially with uh, displacement of the tip and the substrate. That's indicated in the middle panel of, of this data slide on the left. And then if you apply that simple analysis that I sketched out on the previous slide, you can back out work functions or heights of barriers. And the heights of the barriers that he quotes in this 1996 paper, uh, these heights are very, very consistent with what you would expect uh, from your prior knowledge of work functions of metals, right? So he showed very nicely uh, that if you take extreme caution and, and uh, exercise all due diligence, then in fact the barrier heights that determine the tunnel current variation with Z, those barrier heights do in fact come close to matching the work functions of elements that, that have, have been known in the literature for a hundred years. Right. So his paper was, I don't know if it was the first the, to show this uh, clearly, but it was certainly a revelation to me that you had to uh, be very, very careful about cleanliness, of both tip and substrate, if you want to do careful STM measurements. So I wanted to just mention that these barrier heights are reasonable. They can, they can be a lot lower if there's contamination between your tip and the substrate. And most most of us that were trying to make the measurements, we were trying to make the measurements in a clean environment, which meant dry nitrogen, right? But that's not the same as ultra high vacuum, right? And we did not go through nearly the cleaning techniques that Biesenbacher's group uh, introduced uh, in order to make these measurements. So our measurements were, uh, were much lower for barrier heights than his. Another issue that's kind of important and sort of sets the stage for atomic force microscopy is to ask the question, what's the force of the lead atom on the tip? All right? So, you know, all the early STM work, everybody's very excited because you can get these very beautiful images and uh, you can start to see individual atoms, but then you start to ask yourself, well, why does it work? Uh, because the bias voltage that you apply between the tip and the substrate, that bias voltage could be, let's say, a volt. And if the tip and the substrate are separated by a nanometer, then there's an electric field that's one volt per nanometer. That's about 10 to the ninth volts per meter. Well, I don't think any of you have seen 10 to the ninth volts per meter in your life, right? If you, if you go out in Indiana in the summer in a cornfield when there's a big thundercloud, maybe you'll see 10 to the seventh volts per meter. The electric field between the thundercloud and the earth is on the order of 10 to the seventh volts per meter. That's enough to make your hair stand on end, right? But 10 to the ninth volts per meter is a factor of 100 higher. And those fields are, they, they can be achieved in the laboratory environment, but they're strong enough to actually rip atoms off the tip, right? They just, they just feel desorb. The electric field is so high enough that it desorbs atoms from the tip. So just simple, uh, considerations, back of the envelope arguments would say that these tunnel junctions should be unstable when your bias voltage starts to approach a volt or so. And in fact, anybody that's done STM will tell you that if you put too high of a bias voltage on your tip, your tunneling current goes crazy, right? It's very hard to control a constant tunnel current, presumably because the tip atoms are getting ripped off and moved around, okay? But <clears throat> nonetheless, it's an important question to try to answer. And uh, 
question is, how would you measure those forces? And so there were a number of experiments done in the late 1990s, right? And one technique that was used was to uh, put a gold substrate on the back of a floppy micro cantilever, right? Now, a micro cantilever, if you apply a force to the apex of the cantilever, to the end of the cantilever, the cantilever will bend. And the way it bends is given by these standard equations from mechanics, and these equations will be derived in more detail as we move into the AFM part of the course. But the bottom line is that if you tell me what the spring constant of the cantilever is, K, in newtons per meter, if you tell me the length of the cantilever, L, and if I measure the deflection angle of the cantilever, theta, then I can calculate what the force is exerted on the cantilever to cause it to bend through that angle, theta. So it's just two-thirds KL, theta. That's the bottom line. So the idea is real simple. Right? If you want to measure the force that the tip exerts on the substrate, right, you evaporate a thin conducting layer of material on the back of the cantilever. You slowly bring the tip down and you monitor the deflection of the cantilever. And the deflection of the cantilever is proportional to the force between the tip and the substrate. And the proportionality constant is just two thirds KL, which those are numbers that you know. All right, so that was the idea on how to measure these forces. Um, very nice measurement uh, in this regard was done in uh, 1998. Uh, it was a collaboration between Durig's group in Switzerland and Gruder's group in uh, McGill University in Canada. And I just wanted to show you the results of an experiment that they performed using this cantilever as I described previously. What you're seeing in this plot is the tip sample separation in nanometers. There's an arbitrary zero in the, in the x-axis because it's hard to know precisely where the tip sample contact is, right? It's very hard to establish z equal to zero in any of these scanning probe studies. So they, they've arbitrarily established a zero, and then they varied the tip sample separation by a nanometer about that arbitrary zero position. So they've moved it in a nanometer and they've retracted it a nanometer. And all the while they're retra they're, they're pushing and pulling in, right? They're measuring the deflection of the cantilever. And then from the deflection of the cantilever, they can infer an in absolute values Right, absolute force values, what the force of the tip is on the, on the substrate. And so that's labeled on the left, right? And what they found was that as they, as they move the tip closer to the substrate, right, first there was an attractive force caused the, the cantilever to bend towards the tip. That's represented in this diagram by negative force values. And then as they continued to push the tip in closer, the cantilever actually deflected away that's represented by positive uh, force values on this, uh, this graph. So there's a repulsive and attractive regime, right? They actually mapped out very crudely what the shape of the force versus distance curve looks like using scanning and tunneling microscopy. Okay, that was 1998. Uh, Gruder's group came back in 2005 and did the measurement much more carefully, and I show that data here, right? Same idea, same, same idea of using a cantilever. It's just they got much wider range of currents now, uh, and their tip sample separation is controlled a little bit more precisely, right? The important uh, graph on this slide is, is the data in the far right panel uh, of the force versus tip sample separation, right? What you see is that as you approach, as the, as the, as the tip approaches the, the gold substrate, right, the current goes up roughly exponentially. It's a straight line behavior. Anytime you see a straight line behavior on this, on a log plot of the current versus uh, tip sample separation, that means there's an exponential dependence of the tunnel current with position. And that should be familiar to you by now, right? 
What they found is that the tunnel current increased, increased, increased until they got to this point that they call zero. It's an arbitrary zero. Uh, then the tunnel current saturates beyond that. It doesn't change. And that indicates that the tip is now in contact with the substrate. Right? And you actually have a, you no longer have a tunnel junction anymore. You're not tunneling because the current no longer depends exponentially on separation. You actually now have a physical contact between the tip and the substrate. And what's interesting is when you retract the tip, you pull it out, you can see that that tunnel current is maintained at a constant value for about four, three tenths of a nanometer, right? So how can that be, right? How can that be? What they're, what they're saying is, is the tip comes in, right? The tunnel current increases, increases. Finally, you make contact with the tip. You push the tip, right? Then you start to pull the tip away and the tunnel current stays at the same value for about 0.4 nanometers. Well, that, that's an indication of adhesion. That means that the tip is actually stuck to the substrate. There's a, there's an adhesive force that maintains this tip substrate contact. You can see it. It stays flat. And then finally, the cantilever snaps loose. And then the tunnel current, uh, starts to decrease exponentially with distance as you would expect. Right. And from this data, again, they were able to infer forces because they were measuring the deflection of the cantilever, the angle of the cantilever as it deflected. They, they monitored that very accurately. And the forces they were getting were on the order of 10 nanonewtons or so, right? And the, <clears throat> the force distance curve, there's a bunch of data points. You have to look at the original uh, 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 publication to sort it out. But you can see that the force distance curve is hysteretic. Right? You get a different value coming in and going out. And of course, that difference is because the tip is physically stuck to the substrate. There's, there's actually a, 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 a neck of atoms that forms between the tip and the substrate when the tip physically touches the substrate. So this is, this is one of the early measurements done to try to sort out forces, uh, acting on atoms in, uh, tips, forces, uh, on atoms, acting on substrates. There are various models that have been developed, and I just wanted to call your attention to one model. This is, uh, this is from uh, Julian Chen's nice book on scanning telling microscopy, where he actually calculates the displacement of tip atoms and substrate atoms as the apparent distance from the, the uh, between the tip and the sample is varied. So you can see that <coughs> when the tip sample distance is large on the order of 0.6 nanometers, there's very little displacement uh, between the tip and the substrate, or between the gold substrate atom and the tungsten tip atom. But as the tip gets closer to the substrate, right, the dash curve indicates that the front atom on the gold surface actually pulls toward the tip. Right, it humps up there, it goes up, it goes up by quite a bit, about 40 picometers. Uh, the tungsten atom on the tip also uh, approaches the substrate. It relaxes. Uh, the relaxation of the tungsten atom is, is about a half that of gold because tungsten is certainly uh, a stronger metal than gold, right? And then as you continue to push the tip closer to the substrate, you start to get around separation of about 0.3 nanometers, right? Then only then and only then do you actually return the gold and tungsten atoms to their original positions. And uh, if you continue to make that distance uh, between tip and substrate shrink, then you actually compress the gold atoms and the tungsten atoms. That's indicated by a negative value for the relaxation of the position of those atoms. So the bottom line is, right, you don't, you can believe the calculation or not, right? But the bottom line is that simple models of this tip substrate junction indicate motion of tip atoms by something on the order of pico, tens of picometers as the tip comes closer to the substrate and as it's pulled away, right? 
So this will be an important, this will be a limiting factor, right? It's present all the time. It's always there, right? Whether you see it or not is another issue. But the forces between the tip and the substrate are significant, and they can cause pico, tens of picometers of deformation, easily tens of pico, picometers of separation between, let's say, a tungsten tip and a gold substrate. So that's something you got to remember, especially when we start to talk about AFM in another week, right? That's, that sort of sets the, the scale for the deformations that could occur. <coughs> Another topic I wanted to talk about is how high is an atom in scanning tunneling microscopy? It's kind of an interesting question. Um, you know, everybody in the early days was just excited with, that you could see atomic periodicity of the sub substrate atoms with an STM, and there wasn't much care given to understanding the height of the atoms in the STM images. It was more the periodicity that was the big thing. But as the field evolved, then people started to want to know how high is the height of an atom in an STM image. And so the way you answer that question is you obtain, uh, let's say, a high-resolution STM image of a substrate. Uh, the particular paper I pulled out uh, is by Wiesendager's group in Germany. Uh, they looked at three surfaces, tungsten 110, tantalum 110, and iron 110, right? And they measured the atomic corrugation, the ups and downs that the tip registers as it scans over the substrate. So there's a, you know, you define a line in the image and then you can plot the height profile along that line. And what you find is that the, the distance between the peaks and the valleys is on the order of 15 picometers, implying that the height of an atom in an STM image is on the order of 15 picometers or so, right? It's a pretty straightforward measurement. Interestingly enough, they found that this corrugation depended on the applied voltage to the tip Right? So if you change the, the voltage between the tip and the substrate, this corrugation of the atoms varied, right? Now, this is, this is hard to believe because you'd like to believe the size of the atom is independent of the voltage that you apply to a tip, right? So what's going on? Well, the answer is, as you apply a voltage between the tip and the substrate, you're actually measuring different density of states, right? You're actually measuring different wave functions, and these wave functions can have a corrugation that depends on energy. And so that's, in fact, what they're, what they're observing here. So they imaged very carefully uh, a, a unit cell indicated by this sequence of dots in the bottom right-hand image of this picture, right? The images that they obtained for different bias voltages are pasted as insets into this diagram, and you can see that the corrugation uh, it depends on the bias voltage, right? Which is kind of a surprising result, but in reality, it's just a reflection of this local density of states problem that we've we've sort of been talking about for the last two lectures. Okay, very nice set of data. All right? They went on to explain quantitatively the differences in corrugation by assuming different tip atoms. So I alluded to this uh, about two lectures ago where I said the lead atom on the STM tip can be in different atomic states. Right? These different atomic states correspond to the atomic orbitals that you all learn when you, when you study chemistry in high school. They're referred to in this diagram as the S, S state, the PZ state, or the D2Z state. And depending on which atom, depending on which state the lead atom on an STM tip is, is currently in, this diagram is telling you that you will get different corrugations, different apparent heights measured as the STM rasters over a substrate. Okay, so if you try to measure with any precision the height of an atom in an STM image, 
that's not enough. You got to also know something about the state of the apex atom, that lead atom on the tip. You got to know what quantum state it's in. Okay. If you want to make a very precise measurement of this quantity. So I like this because it just emphasizes how detailed this STM, the, the, the information that this, this thing we call an STM is capable of giving. All right. It really requires a very sophisticated, uh, appreciation of the quantum mechanics, how the states from the substrate couple to the states to the tip. Right. Okay. Last topic is a brief discussion of quantum corrals. This is a uh, this is a topic that emerged oh, maybe four or five years ago in the early two thousands. It's basically driven by the work at IBM Almaden and uh, Stanford University. And it's just a really beautiful example of, of the precision that STM can achieve in, in, uh, in fabricating structures and then measuring the electronic states that are generated by these fabricated structures. So basically, what is a quantum corral in five, five lines or less? Uh, quantum corral is, is some sort of an artificial structure that you construct to confine electrons in a way that not that, that that they're not normally confined, right? So you you have to create some sort of an artificial structure, and that artificial structure has to be efficient at con confining electrons. Uh, the corrals us usually are are constructed on atomically flat metallic substrates, right? So the substrate has to be metallic and it has to be flat. The the uh, essence of a quantum corral is an electron state that is localized on the surface of the metal. So these are surface states that we're looking at. They're not the bulk electron states that we talked about two or three lectures ago. But it turns out a lot of the uh, uh, metals have these surface states located on them. And uh, I think the example I'm going to show is a, is a copper surface. So these surface electron states are there. They're states that just that just run parallel to the surface. They don't they don't propagate into the into the metal surface. What you do uh, to make a quantum corral is you construct from atoms a fence. Right, you make a fence of atoms, and these fence of atoms is then very efficient at electron scattering, and. What the quantum corral demonstrates is that there is a way to transmit information uh, across distances in a metal that does not require wires. Right? You can actually just, if you understand it, you can actually use the wave functions of the electrons themselves to transmit information across a distance without the requirement for uh, uh, wire interconnects. So it's a new way of, of guiding information through solids. And the basic idea is, is illustrated, illustrated on the bottom part of this slide. You probably have seen this in your introductory physics classes, right? If you have an incident wave, plane wave, that uh, strikes a scattering center, uh, the, that incident wave um, is scattered in an isotropic fashion from that scattering center such that new wavelets are produced at the center of that scattering center. And these new wavelets then emanate from the scattering center in a spherically symmetric way that, that I've tried to indicate schematically in that diagram. And the idea is if you arrange these scattering centers in intelligent ways, then you can cause constructive or destructive interference of that scattering, of that scattered wave from each scattering center. And this constructive or destructive interference can set up standing wave patterns, right? That persist over that are that are independent of time, as long as your incident uh, 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 incident wave is is persistent. So that's the basic idea. In this example, um, the incident wave is basically going to be the uh, electron surface states on a metal surface. And these scattering centers are going to be atoms that are arranged with an STM tip into a pre-described shape. So 
What you have to realize is that ellipses are special. The shape of an ellipse is very special when you're thinking about scattered waves. And this was, this was demonstrated back in 1825 by some Germans who took a, uh, an elliptical bowl, filled it with mercury, right? Now, the property of an ellipse is that there are two points in the ellipse called the fo foci, foci of the ellipse. And if you make a disturbance at one focal point of the ellipse, precisely at the focal point, then that wave disturbance propagates outward, reflects from the boundaries of the ellipse, and is then refocused at the second focal point of the ellipse. And so in 1825, what they did is they took an elliptical bowl, filled it full of mercury, and then they carefully dropped little drops of mercury at one focal point. When that drop of mercury lands on the surface confined in this elliptical pattern, in this elliptical shape, it generates an outward going wave. That outward going wave scatters from the elliptical boundary of the bowl, and it's refocused at the other ellipse. Right? And so if you can imagine dropping a steady stream of mercury drops that fall onto one, one uh, focus of the ellipse, then at the other focus of the ellipse, you'll find that these wavelets that are generated recombine. Okay. And this, this is a sketch, right? This is a sketch of what these guys saw in 1825 of, of this whole phenomenon, right? You just, you just do it and you can look at it. And if you're, if you're a careful drawer, you can make a picture that looks like this. Okay. So the thought, Thought is, why not try this with uh, a quantum corral, right? And this this result was was published in Nature, uh, February 2000. This comes out of Eigler's group at IBM Almaden. And what they did is they arranged uh, 36 cobalt atoms to form this elliptical structure, and <clears throat> then they they watched how the electron, these surface electron states that are propagating on the copper 111 substrate, how those electron states scatter from the, that elliptically, elliptically shaped quantum corral of 36 cobalt atoms. And those ripples that you see in the middle of this image are the constructive and destructive interference of these surface states as they bounce around and reflect uh, off those, uh, that elliptical shape of the 36 cobalt atoms. And then to mimic the experiments that that probably are obvious to everyone by now, they they uh, they carefully placed a, another cobalt atom at one focal point of the ellipse, and then they carefully looked, and sure enough, the electron character of the waves that were scattered from that one electron state from that one cobalt atom placed at the focal point of the ellipse. The character of that electron state was reformed uh, at the other focal point, as indicated by that small purple-colored uh, uh, region. Right, so they call this a quantum mirage because there's really no atom present at the uh, at the focal point on the lower lower image of this corral. The electron states that are reflected from the atom placed at the focal point in the upper right portion of this corral are uh, reflected from the elliptical shape of the corral and reconverge and, uh, and form the, the so-called image of the atom, okay? So it's a beautiful demonstration. Uh, it's, it requires a lot of expertise just to make the corral and, and uh, that, that takes time. I think this is a this is a, a artist conception of what's going on. If, if you if you wanted the details, okay. If you want the details, you got to look. And and I looked at Feide and Heller's paper, uh, reviews of modern physics. They actually worked out the theory and compared the theory to the experiment, right? So uh, first, let's just do the empty corral the corral without any atoms placed at the focal point. 
right? So the top image is the topography, right? What you would expect uh, theoretically, taking everything into account that you can possibly take into account. And then on, on the right is, is what you would measure experimentally. And you can see those ripples, right? The ripples inside the corral are produced by the surface electron states that are bouncing around inside the corral. And they produce this characteristic ripple pattern. And you can see, uh, you can't see that ripple pattern except if you use STM, right? It's very, very tiny, right? But you can measure it with STM. And you can see that the experiment in theory agrees quite well. And then what's more interesting is if you take the, uh, make a density of states plot, right? Because experimentally that's what STM is, is measuring, density of states, right? Measure density of states plots function of X and Y. Again, you got a theory and an experiment, right, for an empty corral. And what you'll notice is that uh, theory predicts um, uh, depressions, dark spots at the focal points. And those dark spots in the focal points are actually measured experimentally. So that means there's a deficit of electrons uh, at, at the focal point of that ellipse when there's no atoms present. Okay? When there's no atoms present. If you, if you then uh, drop an atom in, the situation changes. So again, the top two panels on this slide show the topography. Right, so the topography is, is very clear. The white spot at the focal point is, is, is an indication that an atom has actually been placed there. Okay, an atom has actually been placed there now. And it modifies the, uh, uh, topography of the, of the interference pattern a little bit. If you go back and forth between this slide and the previous slide, you can see subtle differences in the topography between the two images. But, when you look at the density of states, the density of states is now modified uh, enormously. Uh, in fact, you can see that that hole that was on both sides of the ellipse before, that hole has now disappeared. There's now a high density of states uh, associated with the, the placement of that atom at the ellipse. And that density of states is then reflected and combined and refocused onto the uh, focal point on the left-hand side. The reconstruction of the density of states is not perfect because the scattering, there's scattering processes involved in this, uh, um, this, this process, right? The electron states don't live forever. And if, if they did, then I think you would get a, an exact mirror image on the left compared to the right. Okay. That's my understanding. So it's a little bit more complicated than this because cobalt is a magnetic Atom, and so there are, there are, there are, there is an interaction between the magnetic state of the electrons, the spin of the electron, and the magnetic atom of cobalt. Uh, that's discussed in much more detail in, in Feide and Heller's paper. So if, if that's of interest to you, you have to go and, and actually read their, their, uh, their very nice theoretical, uh, understanding of this. Okay, if you like to see simulations on the web, uh, I was looking around this summer and I actually found a web page that allows you to simulate these uh, quantum corrals. So if you go to that web page, you can, you can watch how these things develop in, uh, right before your eyes. So, I think I'm about done summarizing scanning telling microscopy, and I'd like to summarize, right? Uh, we had to go very quick. Um, I tried to hit the high points. Um, I tried not to tell too many lies so that you have a sense of what's important and what's not. Um, and what you, what you realize after you do this, the scanning telling microscopy for a number of years is that to really do it well, you need very flat substrates. They have to be electrically conducting and they have to be well characterized. So they can't, they can't be changing as you do the experiment. They have to be reasonably stable. That's what I mean by well characterized. The best experiments are done in ultra high vacuum and at low temperatures. If you do not have UHV and low temperature STM, 
uh, you're probably not competitive with the best groups in the world. Um, the experiments require lots of time and, and money. The equipment is not cheap. It's a million dollars plus to build nowadays. Uh, and it often takes four or five years just to custom build a, uh, an STM chamber to do a certain, certain uh, type of experiment. You really need a lot of infrastructure to make these experiments work, so you need a group. You need an extended group of students and postdocs that stay with the, the lab for long periods of time, right? Because the tricks that are learned have to be passed on to the newer students. And if you're constantly losing students and not, not maintaining them, it's really tough to, to do these state-of-the-art uh, measurements. And then lastly, you really need some good theoretical support because ultimately you have to be able to do these density of states calculations to compare theory with experiment. So if you're not working with a talented theorist or a ta talented theoretical group, um, it's tough, tough now. Right? In the early days it was okay, but now it's, it's, uh, it's a different, different ball game. So that gets us to about 1986 in the timeline. So we've gone from like 1981 to 1986, five, five lectures. If you come to the next lecture, we're gonna start to talk about the transition from STM to AFM, All right? So I'm just gonna give a little historical perspective. Having lived through that period, I can, I can talk about what it was like. I'll give a little historical perspective uh, on Thursday's lecture. And then I will turn the floor over to my esteemed colleague who will tell you everything you need to know about AFMs. So that's all, for, all I have for today, okay?